Hello, it's Scott Manley here. As you may have heard, I'm a bit of a fan of space and space flight. You know, when I meet regular people on the street, I like to talk to them about space and space flight. And they think, well, that's all very interesting. But they say, I don't have to worry about this stuff in my everyday life. I mean, you don't exactly have to do orbital mechanics to figure out, say, how to get to work. At least that's what they think, because if you're using a phone to navigate, it is using GPS. And for GPS to work, the receiver has to figure out the orbits of the satellites that it's receiving from. So effectively, all navigation we do these days is orbital navigation. You see, GPS has become a core part of technology. Initially, when GPS came along, it was like low precision. It was actually thought that civilian GPS would have a precision of 100 meters. It was more like 30 to 50 meters. But nowadays, it is accurate enough that it is possible to land an aircraft on autopilot, right? I've been flying around an aircraft and I see GPS is everywhere. Like when I fly my service, you might have seen some videos from it and the display in front of me, the primary flight display, displays a 3D model of the terrain. And that is used GPS and orientation data to show what I should be seeing if I was, say, inside a cloud. And, you know, you can see that this is accurate enough that when I come down to the runway, it's putting me in exactly the right position. Uh, also, you know, like every instrument approach, a lot of the instrument approaches these days are all uh, GPS based. And every aircraft flying around is using ADS-B instead of a secondary radar for their locations. As, as I said, it's everywhere. So how did we go from something of this very low precision to something that was so precise? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today, right? So GPS was conceived at the Pentagon over Labor Day weekend in 1973. So this is like the 50th anniversary purely by accident. Yeah, it was back then it was called Defense Navigation Satellite System, DNSS. And they took their inspiration from a couple of projects that already existed. There was the Navy's Timation System, which had high precision clocks on satellites that would just orbit in low orbit and they would beam the time down to military ships or Navy ships so it could be used for other navigation systems. you either tracking against the stars or maybe talking to the Loran system. And there was another project that was a, a, an abandoned idea for satellite-based navigation called Project 621B. So out of this meeting came the basic idea for GPS, uh, where you had uh, 26 satellites in 12-hour orbits, you know, high up, they could see a lot of the surface. So the first uh, GPS satellite was launched in uh, 1978. By 1993, the network was fully operational. And in the intervening years, there were two very important events that uh, sort of shaped GPS in the early years. First, there was the incident with Korea Airlines Flight 007, which on flying from Alaska to Seoul, made a navigational error with the autopilot and moved, flew over uh, you know, Soviet airspace and was shot down with the loss of everyone on board. And as a result of that, uh, Ronald Reagan essentially signed an order saying that the GPS system, although it had been intended for the military, would have a civilian component available to everyone to avoid these things going forward. And then 1990, the, you know, the first Gulf War, at that point, the US military still hadn't been totally sold on GPS capabilities, but the people on the ground, they were finding that these GPS receivers that they had uh, acquired for marine work or you know, on boats, these were perfect for navigating the featureless landscapes of Iraq out in the desert, in the desert storm. And so families back in the US were purchasing these things and getting them shipped to their people on the ground to help them out with their navigation needs. And of course, that then accelerated the Navy's, or sorry, the, the armed forces adoption of GPS. And nowadays we have an incredibly, uh, it's a pervasive system that is everywhere, right? So the basic way that the global positioning system works, as you many of you probably know, is that you have a number of satellites in these high orbits and they are transmitting signals with very accurate clock codes. 
And by reading these signals, you can get a measurement of the distance to the satellite. And by knowing the orbits of the satellite, you can figure out where you are on the surface. And you might think, well, OK, I'm trying to get my position in three dimensional space, so I need three satellites. Not quite, because the satellites have these incredibly accurate, incredibly expensive clocks, and they wanted a system which didn't require incredibly accurate and incredibly expensive clocks on the ground. So what you have is a not quite as good clock, and that means you can't really accurately measure the distance to the satellite, but you can measure the differences in arrival times from these signals and use that to figure out roughly how accurate your clock is. So what you're really measuring is a four-dimensional value, your x, y, z, and your delta t time correction. That means you need a minimum four satellites for GPS to work. Now, the system that initially launched used two different frequencies. It used uh, the L1 frequency, which was 1575.42 megahertz, and then there was the L2 frequency at 1227.6 megahertz. And more modern satellites also have the L5 signal, and we'll talk about that. Now, the initial satellites had the standard uh, positioning system, which was provided by the course acquisition code on the L1 frequency. And then it had the precise positioning system used by the military, and that used the code on L1 and L2. So the way this worked was uh, it used CDMA, right? What is CDMA? Well, um, GPS was actually one of the first systems to actually use this. So. CDMA stands for Code Division Multiple Access. If you, if you are like tuning your car radio to different frequencies, that is frequency division, right? You're using a separate frequency for each transmitter. There's another TDMA is time division. So that's where you have a series of things cooperating on the same frequency and they all choose to transmit at different times and they coordinate amongst themselves. CDMA is Code Division Multiple Access. And this is where it gets cool. So <laughs> what you have is a binary code. And in the case of what's called the course acquisition signal, you have a 1,023-bit a, a sequence, which is unique to each satellite. There's up to 32 different codes. And what you do is you take the signal and you essentially convolve it. We multiply it by the, the signal that's coming in. And if you get the things lined up to within one bit, you will see a very strong correlated signal. And if you're not quite there, you'll have a, like a weak, you know, less than 10% correlated signal. So once you get these things lined up, you can you multiply them out and you can start to extract the actual underlying bit. So this code is just a way of finding the signal and identifying the specific signal. And the beautiful thing is you can have two or three different satellites broadcasting on the same band. You could have like dozens of satellites on the same band. And while they're talking all over each other, by multiplying it by this code, you basically extract out the specific frequency, or the specific data for that satellite. And that's how code division works. So with the geostation, the GPS satellites, the code is transmitted uh, 1,000 times a second. 1,023-bit sequence is transmitted 1,000 times a second, right? And that, in turn, encodes a 50 bit per second data signal. So you have like 20 repetitions of the 1023 bit sequence, and then the bit may flip or not. Uh, and you have like 50 bits per uh, second. Each data frame is like uh, 300 bits, and it takes uh, uh, five data frames to transmit a whole sequence. So you have a 30 second block of data that is being transmitted on the course acquisition frequency. And what this uh, what this contains is uh, synchronization words to actually make sure that the you know you're actually synchronized with the underlying data stream, the timing of each frame. It contains the orbital parameters for the satellite in question. It also then contains uh, parameters for correcting for things like uh, ionosphere and uh, you know solar weather. And finally, it will contain in each 30 second block orbital parameters for at least one other satellite, for one other satellite, not at least. And it, so it iterates through all the other satellites and over 12 and a half minutes, it 
will transmit the positions or the orbital elements of all the other satellites. And that's called startup. So it takes about 12 and a half minutes to fully warm up a GPS receiver. But once it's warmed up, it can store that stuff in memory and predict forward. So the next time it turns on, it knows what satellites it thinks it should be able to see and therefore can quickly bootstrap into this, find, you know, try the relevant code and, uh, you know, synchronize them and hopefully get started a whole lot faster. So anyway, that's roughly how this works. I would like to go into a whole lot more detail, but frankly, uh, that is like a task for somebody that wants to talk about uh, you know, software-defined radio. So anyway, coming back, you have this sequence, so you're transmitting about a thousand you know, bits or chips, as they're called, per second, and you're transmitting these time signatures, so you can tell exactly on the bit boundary what time things are. So you can imagine if the speed of light is 300 uh, kilometers, 300,000 kilometers per second, then 1 million samples per second should get you about 300 meter accuracy. But actually hardware can go better than that because they can actually measure the transitions between bits and get the position estimate down to, you know, like 30 meters or, or thereabouts. Now the military code, it's also transmitted at the same time, but the military code doesn't repeat the same 1024 bits in sequence. It has a, for each satellite, it has a week long sequence. And what you do is you get, you sort of tune in, you synchronize using the course acquisition code, which will let you know what time it is. And then from that code, you can then figure out where you are in the big long week sequence and then synchronize to that. And then now you're in on the military channel and the military channels use 10 times the bit rate so they can get shorter, more accurate measurements. But more importantly, they can all, they also work on two different frequencies, the L1 and the L2. And by having two different frequencies, you can compensate for one very important source of error, the delay due to the ionosphere. So the ionosphere is up above the atmosphere. It's a region where you have free electrons that have been pushed all, you know, kicked off their atoms by things like cosmic rays and more importantly, ultraviolet light from the sun. And these electrons and protons floating around, they interact with the radio waves and slow them down a little. So because of the ionospheric delay, uh, that translates to a delay in the signal equivalent to about 10 to 20 meters. So you lose about you know, 10 to 20 meters of accuracy just because of ionospheric delay. And as I said, the basic civilian signal that's transmitted includes a model of the ionosphere, which is you know, specific to that time. And so it changes over time, they can update it. And so they can cut that error in half using this very simple model. But the military system, because it has two different frequencies and because the effect of the ionosphere is dispersive, that is, it affects different frequencies by different amounts, you can look at the differences between the L1 and the L2 frequencies and compute the actual electron density and therefore what the actual delay should be and almost remove it entirely just by using the two different frequencies. So yeah, the military signal was a lot more accurate. Originally, the US, uh, when they designed it, they thought that they would have 100 meter precision for the civilian system. And that was what they wanted it to be kept at. The problem was then that people that looked at the signal and worked with their you know, smart human brains on it, they were able to get higher and higher precision. So another system had been designed into GPS to make it less accurate for civilians. They, it was a feature called selective availability. And that's where they would introduce very subtle clock delays. The clocks on the satellites would wobble back and forth by less than a microsecond. And they would do this in a way that could be calculated by the military side, but not by the civilians. And so that meant that when selective availability was turned on, the civilian gear would uh, vary its location by about 50 to 100 meters. And you know, this, uh, this was, well, this is what the military wanted, but it turned out that the US government is not a monolithic entity. And there were other agencies that really wanted to use this global positioning system. There was the US Coast Guard, the Department of Transport, the FAA. They all wanted better precision for their particular things. And even though the Department of Defense and these guys were all on Team USA, they couldn't get special treatment. 
So they had to come up with their own solutions independent of the Department of Defense. The US Coast Guard wanted really accurate navigation data to help shipping around the coast, and so they came up with something called differential GPS. I mean, they didn't invent it, but they began to deploy it. The idea with differential GPS is that you have uh, receivers that are placed at known points where you know the precision to within millimeters. And they then take the, GS, uh, the GPS signals, they measure them, and they compare their solution to what it should be. And by then subtracting that error and telling everyone around them, they can say, well, I'm measuring, you know, 10 meters east of where I really am. So everybody nearby them says, well, I will adjust my position by 10 meters <laughs> to the east that I'm actually in the correct location. And this was great. This meant they could get you know, resolution of a few meters, and that allowed the US Coast Guard to work with shipping and to transmit correction data to ships that were working in and around the US. Now, it wasn't just the US Coast Guard that did this. Countries all over the world took GPS and they built their own differential GPS systems. I mean, the difference is that the US, you know, well, the US Coast Guard would obviously go to, you know, US government Thanksgiving dinner and be all passive aggressive towards the Department of Defense. Where's my precision? Come on. So the fact that the US government was sort of competing against itself on this GPS precision thing wasn't lost on the higher ups in, in the US government. And uh, in May of 2000, they turned off selective avail availability forever. And uh, yeah, you, there's actually great graphs showing the drop the, or the increase in the precision exactly at 4 a.m. on like May 2nd or whatever. It's also interesting if you look at this graph, you can see the horizontal error and the vertical error are separate on these. And it's, if you look carefully, you'll see that the vertical error, the error in your altitude, is about twice as much as the horizontal error. And this is important. The reason why this happens is if you think about it, you want to have the widest range of directions so that you can get best precision, right? If you have everything all in one direction, then you've got almost no, uh, you've got a lot of errors. But if you have things at like almost opposite sides of the sky, that's like almost the best condition. However, while you can have satellites to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west, you can't have satellites up and down because the ones below you can't be seen. So you have only like half the space to work with in the vertical axis. Therefore, you have half the precision in the vertical axis. So you know, that vertical error was very important for one other government agency, the FAA. They wanted to revolutionize uh, aerial navigation using GPS and GPS was not accurate enough for them. Again, the original spec said 100 meters, and that was definitely not good, especially when you consider the vertical differences would be even larger. So the FAA were working on their own differential GPS solution, but instead of transmitting the, uh, the augmentation the right, directly to the aircraft via ground-based antenna, they wanted to send everything up to satellites in geostationary orbit and then have those send down to the aircraft using pretty much the same protocols that uh, G, um, GPS you know, systems actually used. So this is what's called a satellite-based augmentation system. You use uh, geostationary satellites, and these aren't like US government geostationary satellites. These are just commercial GEO satellites and US, you know, Federal Aviation, they buy like some bandwidth on it, they put in their software and they are just basically transmitting this data down in format that is usable by aircraft. So it's called the Wide Area Augmentation System or WAS and it is pretty much required on any new aircraft. In fact, indeed, many old aircraft have it now despite it being a very kind of new system. It was originally deployed in 2003 and like as of 2020, I think it was pretty much required in every aircraft that operates in uh, the major airspaces in the US. So if you want to fly within 30 miles of a class Bravo, that is something like San Francisco airport, then you have to have uh, ADS-B, which requires a WAS-capable GPS system. 
Now, Europe has a similar requirement. They have their own network. It's called EGNOS, the European Geostationary Navigation Overlay Service. And it literally is the same technology using practically the same protocols to the extent that the same hardware on the aircraft can talk to both systems and interoperate correctly. So the goal of the FAA was to get the precision down to about 7.5 meters of accuracy. And, but actually, they did way better. It turns out the measured performance is about one meter precision at the 95th percentile. And the other thing about this whole WAS system is that it doesn't just augment the quality, the accuracy of the satellites. They can also detect when there is a misbehaving satellite and instantly tell all the aircraft to start ignoring this particular satellite. And this happens. There were cases where like satellites were moved on orbit and they weren't taken out of the network. And so your aircraft or, uh, that were using this satellite suddenly found their positions drifting by about 100 meters, which would be really bad if you were, say, on a very narrow uh, approach into uh, you know, one of these mountain airfields and you couldn't see where you were going. Uh, you know, when you're flying with uh, instrument rules, you need the, all the precision you can get. And these days, if you look at the majority of uh, instrument procedures, they are all now coming up with uh, GPS-based procedures because they work, they are more diverse. A lot of the old navigation hardware like VORs and non-directional beacons and DME, these old ground-based systems are either being disabled or they're being you know, shut down or they're failing and nobody's wanting to repair them because they're not essential. And so. Over time, we've not only added a whole bunch of GPS-based approaches to airfields which would never have them, but we've also got rid of a lot of the old hardware and this is starting to dominate. One of the important things to realize about these differential GPS systems is that the accuracy you know, enhancement falls off as you get further and further from the ground station because there's just differences in the strength of the ionosphere over, over time, over you know, distance. So, there's another thing they have is like a local augmentation system where you have a specific airport with a specific uh, receiver and then that can transmit updates locally to those aircraft and then they can get again this sub meter precision using GPS with the local augmentation and that's great if you want to get very accurate approach vectors for you know any runway. Just say you have like two or three four or five runways and you don't want to have to build instrument landing system antennas for all of them, you just put in one GPS, you know, augmentation system and boom, you've got the ability to define approaches for all of these things and get your aircraft landed. You can even define approaches which would never have been possible using the, the previous gear. So yeah, the success of this WAS system means that the terrestrial network that had been developed by the Coast Guard was no longer being needed anymore. And so it was actually shut down in 2020. And now even the marine shipping is able to use these uh, area augmentation systems. And now the GPS satellites themselves, those are also undergoing improvements, uh, modernization of the protocols. So back in 2005, we got the first modern satellite that was launched. There was a Block 2R-M, and this started transmitting new civilian signals. It was called the L1C and the L2C. And that meant that we had a civilian signal on the L1 and the L2 frequencies, so you could do those direct ionospheric measurements. They also added the L5 frequency. Right, this is another frequency range. It was down in the, a range of frequencies which were supposed to be for uh, aviation navigation. So this fit right in. It transmits at higher power. There's more resolution in the signal. Um, and that means there's less problems with interference, right? Also, new data formats. So the L1C it transmits on the same frequency as the course acquisition. And the thing is, they didn't want to just shut down the old uh, course acquisition system, so they kept that running. What you have is the new civilian signal is still transmitting. It's using different codes, different code sequences. So uh, by CDMA, you can still pull this out. But there's a neat trick that they did by uh, carefully choosing their sequence. They can shift like the spectral power around the center of the frequency so that they like so the the original one had this like big peak in the middle and then you have a minima and these bit you know lobes that come out well 
they changed the bit sequence in a very subtle way to make it wiggle more. And now instead of having a big peak in the middle, they've got nothing in the middle and the lobe comes up. And so if you look at these two things on top of each other, the two different civilian signals, the old one and the new one, the old one is strong in one place and where the old one is weak, this new one is strong. So they're complementing each other, literally fitting the bits into the gaps in the spectra just by very carefully doing the math on their Fourier series. It's very clever. And, uh, you know, they do the same thing with the military signal. The new military signal um, pushes a lot of the energy far out into the lobes, which actually then apparently makes it harder to jam because if you, like, jam the middle of the frequency, sure, you take out the old uh, geos you know, GPS, but the military one is sitting far out on the sides and it's sort of just working just fine while everybody else's GPS stuff isn't working. This is It's all, like, very clever stuff and I wish I totally understood it. Now, I should probably finish as well by saying that GPS isn't the only game in town. The, when we're talking about global navigation satellite systems, there's at least three other major players. There's GLONASS, which is the or Soviet, which became a Russian system. There's the European Galileo and the Chinese Beidou. And they're all actually pretty close in the design. They all have their bands very close to each other. The formats are largely software differences. And uh, I mean, one thing that is significantly different is that the old GLONASS actually uses different frequencies for the satellites. And I think it's interesting because I think they have like eight frequencies available and they have 16 satellites. So the way they fix this is they make sure that the same frequency is assigned to satellites that are on the opposite side of the, e the Earth from each other. So they will never interfere. So they have these pairs that are opposing and on the same frequency. But yeah, other than that, like all these different networks, they all, talking to them is largely a software change. And that's important if you're, say, building the aviation, you know, the GPS systems, or the global, the navigation systems for aircraft, because it's literally a software tweak to switch from one to the other and to transparently move from one country to another and provide consistent navigation so that you can make these accurate approaches and landings. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.